Um, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Um, this is the webinar for Halt Mariner Now, um, Are You in the Blast Zone? And um, we're coming to you with the assistance today of Halt the Harm Network. Um, Ryan Clover is usually uh, the co-host here for Halt the Harm, but um, he is at home right now um, with his new baby. So we want to wish him well and we're but I want to mention Halt the Harm Network because they have a wonderful network um, and uh, the ability to help people um, when, uh, with different projects and different technical things like webinars. So we want to thank them for, for helping us with this webinar today. And just to can kind of give you a little bit, bit of background, this is a coalition effort of a bunch of different organizations across Pennsylvania. And we've got together and we decided to, um, to do some webinars on um, different topics, mainly the risk assessments and um, all the destruction to waterways, which we'll talk about later. And um, this will, so we're hoping that this will get the information and education out to folks so they can understand what's going on with the pipeline. Um, today we'll have um, Jenny Kearslake. She is the founder of West Whiteland Residence for Pipeline Safety, founder in the leadership team of Del Chesco United Pipeline Safety. She's a mother, she's an earth scientist, um, artisan, entrepreneur, and community leader. Um, and then we have George Alexander. He's part of the leadership team for Del Chesco United for Pipeline Safety. He also runs a blog, Dragon Pipeline Diaries. And I'm Jillian Graber. I'm the executive product, um, director of Protect PT, Protect Penn Trafford. Uh, we have the, the Mariner East coming through Westmoreland County, coming through our, our community. And uh, we're joining forces with um, other folks across the state to bring you this campaign uh, and this educational presentation today. So first thing we're gonna have Ginny, uh, she's gonna be presenting on the nuts and bolts of Mariner East, uh, how Mariner is regulated, eminent domain, uh, public utility um, for formal complaints. And um, so go ahead, Ginny, take it away from here. Hi everyone, um, thanks for being here first of all. And um, this is the first time I've participated in a webinar as a panelist. So here we go. Um, let's get right down to the basics. Mariner East is a pipeline project by Sunoco and Energy Transfer. Um, you may be familiar with the name Energy Transfer from the Dakota Access Pipeline um, and the Revolution Pipeline, it's the same company. So Mariner East consists of three pipelines. There's Mariner East One, which is a repurposed pipeline, an eight inch pipeline that was put in the ground in the 1930s. Um, and the flow was reversed and they put a new product through it, the natural gas liquids, and put that into operation at the end of 2014. So it's been flowing basically consistently um, for the past five years almost. And then right now, Sunoco is constructing Mariner East 2 and Mariner East 2X which are um, 20 inches and 16 inches. And what something that Sunoco did and put into operation the end of last year was what they like to call Mariner East 2, but it's actually not Mariner East 2. We call it the Mariner East 2 workaround or also the Franken pipe. And what it is is a um, temporarily cobbled together pipeline that's constructed with bits and pieces of ME2, ME2X, where they've been in the ground. And then in Delaware and Chester County, where neither of those pipes are in the ground, um, or not consistently, they have tied into an old 12-inch pipeline from the 1930s and have bypassed that area. So that is also in operation. Right now we have the workaround and ME1. The next slide. So Mariner East um, is a 350 mile long pipeline that originates in the west in the Marcellus Shale. And you can see the route here going across the state and ending in Marcus Hook, which is uh, on the port on the Delaware River. Um, it traverses through farmland and woodland, um, water resources, high density communities, it goes through the schoolyards of over 40 schools. It goes past nursing homes and special needs communities. Um, and one thing to note here is that you can see that the pipeline actually starts in Ohio. 
and then the bulk of it is in Pennsylvania. But even though it's in two states, it was given in Pennsylvania interstate status, which means that it comes under control of the state, um, not the nation. We'll go to the next slide. Oh, I think we missed a few there. And back one, back another one. Um, there we go. Okay, so what is flowing through Mariner East? Um, it's different than the pipelines that we're used to. Um, it's not methane, it's not natural gas, but instead it's highly volatile liquids and specifically natural gas liquids. Um, those are, that's ethane, butane, and propane um, that are byproducts of fracking. So what Mariner East really does is it brings uh, it brings fracking into our communities in the southeast in a way that we've never seen before. So it's actually put many of us in touch with what other parts of the state have been dealing with and made us woke about that, um, you could say. Um, these gases are liquefied under high pressure in order to run them through the pipelines. And when Mariner East is all said and done, if that happens, um, Sunoco is planning on pumping over 700,000 barrels per day through these pipelines. And we can go to the next one. I think we skipped one again. There we go. Um, so these pipelines are not for us. This product is primarily being exported overseas to deal with an oversupply of this material that we have in the United States. And uh, the bulk of it is the ethane and it's being used to make plastics. Um, we're looking at markets in um, Norway and Scotland right now. And to put that 700,000 barrels per day into perspective, my friend George, who will be speaking later, uh, worked it out to almost a billion dollar, uh, sorry, a billion plastic water bottles per day would be produced from that if it was all going to that kind of uh, product. Um, another thing to realize is that Mariner East is not creating jobs for uh, Pennsylvanians. That's an industry talking point that it does. Most of the jobs are in construction, so they're temporary and uh, most of them are going to out of state workers. We are only looking at somewhere between 150 and 250 permanent jobs at Marcus Hook. Next slide, please. So we are essentially assuming all of the risks with none of the benefits. And those risks are um, all of the, they would include the health risks that fracking uh, brings on, and then all of the safety risks too. Um, those would be the, the biggest ones. And the next slide. So who regulates Mariner East? Well, it's, it's not regulated. Um, in Pennsylvania, we have no government body that has clear authority over this project. The Department of Environmental Protection, known as the DEP, um, is in charge of the environmental impacts of construction only. And then the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission, the PUC, has regulatory oversight once the pipes are in operation. So right now that would apply to anyone in the workaround. And uh, their responsibility is to enforce the pipeline and hazardous materials safety administration's guidelines, but FIMSA has no guidelines that are specific for these NGL pipelines. Next. So who approved the siting for this project? Well, again, no one. Uh, Pennsylvania is the only state in the United States that has no siting authority for pipeline routing. The formal approval of the route was done by nobody. The DEP was only concerned with issuing its environmental permits. The PUC granted Sunoco public utility status, um, and that's an important thing that we'll get to in the next slide. Sunoco um, has the ability to put Mariner East wherever it pleases. Next. Um, we, okay, so what that means is wherever it pleases looks something like this. Um, Mariner East can run right past high density housing. Here's some apartment buildings in my township. 
Next. We'll go right past seniors living. This is in East Goshen Township. Some of you will recognize this as the Wellington, which is a very large senior living community. And there you can see Mariner East right in front of it. Next. These pipelines are going right through backyards, right past children's play sets. I, I don't think there's anything, any image more powerful than that one. Next. Um, so because Sunoco has been granted public utility status for this project, uh, that means they also have eminent domain. And what eminent domain does, it allows a corporation to seize property from you. So we don't, as Pennsylvanians, Citizens, we do not have the right to say no to this project. If we don't sign easements for our property, um, Sunoco can come and put Mariner East across it anyway. And typically, public utility status is reserved for things that are good for, for the public, things for the common good, things that are necessities for our society. Well, as I've explained in the previous slides, this is not even for us, it's for export. Um, so it really is an abuse of eminent domain. Great, thank you, Ginny. And uh, next we're going to have George Alexander. He's going to be presenting on why, why the pipeline, why is this uh, pipeline built, being built? Um, what makes it particularly dangerous and what are the risks associated with it? So go ahead, take it away, George. Thank you, Jillian. So uh, Ginny has given you, uh, next slide, yeah. Uh, Ginny has given you the big picture um, of what this pipeline is about. Here you see uh, a diagram basically showing uh, where the ethane runs from the Marcellus Shale over to the Delaware River uh, through the pipeline that we're talking about, then it gets carried by ships, especially built ships specifically for this purpose, to refineries in, in Europe. Um, and recent, more recently, uh, there have also been ships going uh, to India and particularly to China. It looks like it is the next uh, place where this stuff will, will be heading. Um, but it's a massive export project. Next slide. So uh, Ginny mentioned that these um, natural gas liquids, so-called, are byproducts of fracking. This image shows you a fracked well, uh, and out of the fracked well comes a variety of things, including methane, which is the natural gas they're particularly um, designed to extract. But in Western Pennsylvania, they also get a variety of other things, and the main main things they get are ethane, propane, and butane. These are also gases, um, and they're all mixed together, but they can be separated by cooling, and so they cool this stuff, this mixture of gases, to minus 120, and at that point, ethane, propane, and butane are all liquid, but methane is still a gas. So then they can drain off the ethane, propane, and butane, the natural gas liquids, and this is why they're called liquids, um, and separate them from the methane. The methane then goes into the normal natural gas pipelines. But then the question is, what do they do with these natural gas liquids? They're not easy to dispose of. You can't keep them. You, it's un, impractical to keep them at minus 120 degrees all the time. You can only keep them liquid under high pressure, um, but you can't allow them to go back to the gas, the, to the gas state because they're too hard to deal with. Next slide. Um, and these gases are not like ordinary natural gas because uh, ordinary natural gas uh, will rise and disperse. Um, and so it, uh, it may pose a danger in its immediate vicinity, but not at a distance. Uh, and there's an odorant so you know when it's present. These other gases are not like that. They're heavier than air, so they stay low and spread like fog. And because uh, Sunoco is not required to add an odorant, and they don't add one, uh, the risk of explosion is far greater. And a large cloud can, can form, which any, um, any type of spark can ignite. Next, please. 
So on this slide, ignore the fine print for the time being. Uh, what I want to show you here is uh, there are there are two clouds shown here from above. The, the big blue area is, is the cloud that would be formed by propane, which is one of these natural gas liquids under a certain set of conditions, and the little tiny uh, seed-shaped orange cloud is the corresponding methane or natural gas cloud that would be formed under the identical conditions. And basically these clouds show the boundary uh, within which if the cloud is ignited, you're likely to be killed. So what this is showing, and this is true for propane, ethane, and butane, is that the clouds that they form can be dozens of times larger than the, the, than the corresponding cloud of natural gas. We all know about the hazards of natural gas, but not that many people know about what these natural gas liquids carry in terms of risk. Next, please. And in addition uh, to the lack of odorant, there is no other way of uh, reliably detecting a leak. Um, Sunoco, for a very large leak, Sunoco can detect a pressure change, and that might uh, prove a way of, of um, figuring out that a really large leak has occurred. But um, they have no way of, of detecting smaller leaks, and those can be equally devastating. And if a leak were to be discovered, um, it's up to you to get out of there. First responders uh, have been trained to establish a perimeter to keep people out, but they are not allowed to go in. So assuming you get a warning and you know that there is a, a flammable cloud of these gases forming, um, then it's up to you to leave the area. You have to do it on foot because um, if you use a car, that's an ignition source. If you ring a doorbell, that's an ignition source. Uh, uh, if you turn on a light, that's an igni ignition source. Even a cell phone may be an ignition source. So uh, basically you're left with the, the um, task of determining that you're in one of these clouds. You're supposed to, to uh, travel half a mile uphill and upwind um, while avoiding all ignition sources. It's just not a credible plan. Next, please. So uh, this stuff really is explosive. There haven't been very many, fortunately, there haven't been very many incidents where one of these pipelines has actually exploded. And that's because they're still very rare and there are none that run through as populated a state as Pennsylvania is. Um, the upper picture here shows an explosion in Texas almost 25 years ago in a, a ranching area, a rural area. Several square miles were uh, burnt in this explosion, set, uh, three people killed, 21 injured. And um, the lower picture is more like what we might expect in parts of Pennsylvania. This is a picture of a San Bruno, California fire, but this was natural gas. If it had been um, natural gas liquids. It could have been far worse than what you see in that photo. And um, some of you may remember a few years ago, there was an explosion in another rural area near, nearer to us, Follinsby, West Virginia, uh, which took out, again, several square miles, but fortunately, uh, no one was in the area at the time, although the siding was melted off the side of the nearest house. That's the kind of thing that could happen in, in our area. That's what uh, keeps me worried at night. Uh, next slide. Um, here's another case uh, closer to home of a natural gas accident. This was April of 2016. Um, and uh, it was very fortunate that no one was killed here. Again, not a densely populated area, uh, but uh, these things are so explosive that um, it, you have to be a long way away in order to uh, avoid fatalities. Um, some of you will remember last fall in Beaver County, a uh, different Sunoco pipe pipeline exploded after only a week in operation um, and burnt down the nearest house. Um, no one was killed in that one either, but that was pure luck. 
Next, please. So how uh, risky are these things? I, I've given you some intuitive idea of that, I hope. But there have been two formal uh, risk assessments done. Um, both of them, the results were both um, released in uh, 2018. The first one was uh, launched by State Senator Andy Dinneman um, and uh, funded by a GoFundMe uh, project. And it showed that uh, you could be killed within uh, a distance of more than 2,000 feet from the pipeline. The Delaware County Council then commissioned a, a somewhat different one from a different group um, and using different software, they showed uh, a significantly greater range of potential fatality up to uh, a mile and a third. Um, so uh, uh, next slide, please. So what these uh, two risk assessments showed was basically statistically what the individual risk is of for a person at a distance from this pipeline. And that's what you call individual risk. And it's the kind of thing you might consider if you were thinking of buying a house at a given distance from the pipeline. But it only assesses one person's risk. Uh, more important from my perspective is societal risk. This is uh, the, the risk that you run if there is a gathering of people that's relatively close to the pipeline. Um, each of whom has that same individual risk, but as a group, they have a huge risk. Um, that has not been assessed, but that uh, applies to places such as schools, libraries, nursing homes, and so forth. Um, and um, a very important type of risk that is harder to quantify because of the uh, need to characterize the demographics of where everybody moves around, but um, critical. And then the third one, worst case risk is, well, suppose you had the worst possible rupture in the worst possible location, what would happen then? That's the risk that emergency management needs to be prepared for. That's uh, where the planning of the first responders needs to come in. And no one has been focused on that worst case risk. Um, Sunoco will tell you these worst cases are uh, um, extremely unlikely. And I, that is true. I, I accept that. But on the other hand, disasters are almost always extremely unlikely. We have to be ready for such a thing. And as I say, only individual risk has been assessed so far. And I would also mention that these risk assessments that I'm talking about here are strictly related to the risk of uh, pipeline leak locally. They don't address the risks that people on the fracking end of the process experience. So part of the risk associated with a pipeline is the risk uh, it causes to the people who, with whom the gas originates. And that's another important piece of this uh, risk assessment that has not been done. Please. So the route, where does it go? It goes strikingly close to a lot of built up places. Here you see the area just south of Pittsburgh and the black line is the pipeline and the uh, darker purplish areas are the areas of dense population. You can easily see that the route of this pipeline is not designed to avoid populated areas. And it's easy to understand why. This was originally a pipeline that was designed to carry fuel oil and gasoline from refineries in the Philadelphia area to the west. And then it made sense for that to go near populated areas because that's where the markets are. But when you reverse that and put these uh, natural gas liquids from, frac uh, from, from fracking through the same pipeline, uh, you are running an unnecessary risk because that pipeline goes through so many populated areas. Uh, next map, please. So here's the, in the uh, mountainous part of the state um, where the pipeline route goes. And although it's far less populated than the Pittsburgh area, you can still see that it goes quite close to a lot of areas of population. So there are very, very few er uh, places along this pipeline where a serious leak would not be expected to cause fatalities. Next map. 
here's the area around Pittsburgh, and you can see that it goes quite close to uh, Pittsburgh and in between um, various other population centers in the middle or the eastern the Middle Eastern part of the state. Um, there are a lot of uh, people at risk in these areas. Uh, next map. And here is the southeastern Pennsylvania in the outskirts of Philadelphia. And in the lower uh, part of this map, you can see uh, that, that in Chester and Delaware County, this pipeline goes right through the center of some of the most populated areas. Up in Berks County at the upper left, you see that it runs right by the, the city of Reading. Slide. So here's an example of what that flammable cloud that I was talking about uh, from those risk assessments might look like if there were a rupture uh, adjacent to Mechanicsburg. Mechanicsburg is just uh, west of of, Pitts, of uh, Harrisburg. And uh, you can see uh, this is a, a cloud extending a little over a mile into Mechanicsburg. And if it, uh, it would extend to this size within uh, about five minutes from a rupture. And uh, then if it encountered a source of ignition, every uh, that whole area would be on fire. And everyone who is outdoors in that area would be killed. Many of the people indoors would be killed as well. Um, it would be difficult for first responders to get in. And how would they even decide where to go uh, and who to rescue? Uh, it's, you know, it's almost inconceivable, this type of accident. And yet, it's what this pipeline threatens. Next slide. OK, back to Ginny at this point. Yeah, thanks, George. That was great. Um, so I'm going to quickly go over some cases that are before the PUC right now. Um, first one is uh, the Safety 7 case. Um, Safety 7 is seven residents from mm -hmm. Delaware and Chester County, and they filed a formal complaint with the PUC, um, essentially about the, lake, the lack of credible emergency plans and other safety concerns. That's why we call Safety 7. Um, the PUC has consolidated several other cases with that, um, but from other residences, so it's kind of a monster complaint right now. And a number of townships, counties, and school districts and residents have intervened. I'm one of the interveners on that myself. Um, a hearing is not scheduled until next summer, summer of 2020. But in October of this year, on um, October 23rd and 24th, there is a hearing um, in Westchester to take lay witness testimony. Um, another case is the Public Utility Commission's own Bureau of Investigation and Enforcement. This uh, complaint comes from their investigation into the 2017 Morgantown leak on uh, Mariner East One. And they determined in their investigation that um, that was caused by, that leak was caused by corrosion. And they also found that Sunoco had failed to follow their pipeline integrity management program. So they filed this complaint. Um, they expressed in their complaint a concern for corrosion all along Mariner East One throughout the state and the need to do an end of life study. Uh, that's an end of life for the pipeline, not lives. Um, and they, um, the PUC's Bureau of Investigation, in, Investigation and Enforcement actually settled this complaint um, with Sunoco. And then it went to the PUC commissioners who uh, denied the settlement. They didn't ratify it. So it's been sent back to the administrative law judge and we're expecting a hearing at some point on that. And then the final case that's uh, in progress still is Wilmer Bakers, and Wilmer Baker is a resident in um, Cumberland County, and his complaint is based on uh, primarily the quality of seal that's used in Mariner 2 and 2X, and a lack of public um, education and emergency preparedness. Um, that case has been heard, and we're waiting for the ruling on that. Um, one side note on that is I, I attended that hearing and I sat in the hearing room for two days and um, 
Wilmer is representing himself and he had to go up against an army of lawyers from Sunoco. And it was really just a clear example of how broken our system is. In order for a citizen to have their uh, safety concerns um, addressed, they actually have to bring them before a judge. And um, that's how things are right now in Pennsylvania. And the system seems to, um, by design, work in favor of the oil and gas industry and not us. Um, if you would like to follow any of these cases or stay abreast of, of new ones, um, I put a link here um, for uh, where you can search and you just use the docket number. I include, included the docket number for these three cases. Um, one other small note is that the Safety 7 case um, is raising funds to pay for their expert witness and court costs. And um, I included a website um, for that GoFundMe. So all donations, big or small, are really appreciated for that. Next slide. Great. It's Jillian. Thank you, Ginny. Uh, thank you, George. So you might be asking yourself, well, you know, this, maybe this goes through my community, maybe this doesn't, maybe I'm going to be in the blast zone, even though I'm several miles from the actual pipeline. Uh, and what can I do? So the first thing you can do is stay informed and educated through our website. So haltmarinernow.org, uh, and then uh, George's blog, Dragon Pipeline Diary, uh, tomorrow, we're actually going to have what's called a thunderclap. And just to kind of give you a brief overview, that, that's where you go onto social media, primarily Twitter. We're going to be on Facebook. We're going to be on Instagram. And so if you sign up at that bit.ly, uh, that bit.ly slash mm or hmn, and this is case sensitive social, um, you can sign up to be a part of that. And all you have to do is go onto our Twitter account, um, Halt Mariner Now, and uh, when we tweet out something, retweet it, share it on Facebook, share it with your friends. Um, we'll, we'll, and we have a bunch of different um, hashtags and different people that we want to tweet to, one of them being Governor Wolf, because he has the power to do something about this. He has the power to take that risk that George was talking about away from all these Pennsylvanians simply by shutting the project down, which is our, what our ultimate goal is, that until these safety risks are, are you know, addressed and we have a real solution and a real plan to, uh, to, to figure out how we're going to deal with these safety risks, we don't want the pipeline to go forward. Um, so please join in the thunderclap because this is going to really put the pressure on him to do something about it. We're also asking people that if you have pictures, uh, there's been a lot of destruction about with the building of this pipeline. So if you have pictures of that uh, that you wanna share with us, just email them to info at haltmarinernow.org. Uh, and join in our thunderclap tomorrow simply by going on that link. Um, I should also mention that this what we this webinar is live streaming on our Facebook and it will be available to anybody that registered ahead of time. It will be available for viewing later. Um, another thing that you can do is get connected to people that are currently working um, on this particular subject. So if you go to the haltmarinernow.org website, we've got a lot of information on the website. I'm gonna walk you through some of it right now, um, but you wanna connect with other groups that have been working. And if you're in an area where there isn't a group that's working, you can connect with other people and share resources. We're gonna have a lot of different resources that you can share in order to inform people in your community and do something about um, mishaps and, and things that are happening. So we always say, um, see something, say something. Um, and we have a document on our website called um, how to document and report problems with Mariner East pipelines. And it gives you all the information you need to know uh, in order to document and report those, those um, conditions to the, um, the oversight uh, that that does uh, somewhat exist with, you know, these different um, these different agencies across the state, because uh, you know, like Ginny was saying, one one agency may have a little bit of 
of um, oversight here. Another agency has a little bit of oversight there, but nobody's really paying attention to the project at whole. So it's important to, um, to know who to contact when you have an issue and um, make sure you're, you're reporting that issue to the right person. Um, so right now I'm gonna go over some of our website tools really quick. Um, this, these, this is directly from our website and give me one second here to maximize. Um, so this is our actual website, uh, the home is here. Uh, you could have registered for the webinar. You'll be able to register for the next webinar here. You'll be able to join our Thunderclap. Also the risk assessment. Uh, we have our partnering organizations. So other organizations that are partnering together in this coalition. Um, and for some reason it's not working when I <laughs> click on that. Um, oh, no, I don't know why. Um, and then the risk assessment um, is here as well. The full risk assessment. Uh, and then get connected. And I'm not really sure why it's not coming up here. I apologize for that. Technology is not working very well. But um, under this get connected page, let me see if I can get it to, to come up here for you all. Um, if I'm screen sharing, Give me one second. Jenny, George, can you see, still see my screen? Just chime in if you can. Yes, I can see your screen. All right, it's still not loading. I apologize. <laughs> we tested this and uh, it loaded just fine. Um, so let me see. You can also request a media toolkit, which gives you some of that information. Um, and because it's not loading, I'm going to just go back to the webinar right now. You can also request a yard sign. Um, so when you request a yard sign, we, uh, so we have, um, we're going to be uh, buying these yard signs and we want to distribute them throughout the pipeline area. Um, so if you would like a yard sign, please let us know. I'm going to go back to this slide right here, because this is what I wanted to show you. So this is under the Get Connected on the website. Um, so it talks about having a problem. So if you're having a problem, this is that document. You can actually just download the document on how to, how to document and report complaints. Uh, it's a two-page document. You can print it out and have it in your home for when things go wrong or when things happen, just so you know what to do. And then there's another thing that I want to bring to your attention. So once you have complained to the appropriate authority, uh, it's very uh, interesting to find out what have they done with your complaint? What's happening? Um, are they following through? And that's something that we have um, at Protect BT, we've helped track these things. And also we can track the amount of complaints that are happening in a particular area. So if you go to this, this if you click on this tab right here, um, click here to get started, it takes you through a list of questions and it's just a Google Doc. It will send the information to us and we can have it as a clearinghouse of information of who you've contacted, um, whether it's the PUC or the DEP, what type of issue you're having. And then we can bring this to people that could potentially have the power to do something like the governor and say, look at all these hundreds of complaints. Look at the people that have been dealing with the destruction of this pipeline. And uh, we can try to follow through, through right to know requests and through, um, through informal file reviews and see if the agencies that you're reporting to are doing something about your complaint. So that's really important. Um, and then you can contact other, um, other people that are working around the state uh, and um, and get a yard sign right from our website. And I promise you it does work even though it's not working on my slides. Um, okay, so how to get involved? Sign up for our social media thunderclap tomorrow evening or tomorrow afternoon. It's gonna be from three to five. Um, you can sign up with that bit.ly link right there. 
after you sign up, um, Mary, uh, our, our outreach assistant, she will actually be sending out um, the, the information to everyone that signs up. So they have all of the tweets, all of the suggested posts, and you can have it all right there. So you don't, um, you could just cut and paste it if you'd like, or just retweet if you wanna engage in that. Also tell your friends, and then stay connected because we're gonna have other webinars and we're going to have other alerts that we wanna make sure that everyone has access to. So stay connected and sign up through our email alerts on our website. There's just a form on the right, on the homepage where you can sign up to get that information. And then Ginny, do you wanna take this through? We're right at about 45 minutes. So I wanna make sure we have time for Q&A yep. real quick. Um, do you wanna go through these real quick? Sure, let's go through really quickly. We just threw in some pictures here at the end for to show you some of the things that we're doing here in Chester and Delaware County. Um, we've hold, held a number of rallies. So here's a picture from one of those. Um, sometimes people do an action all by themselves. This is an East Goshen Township Supervisor who made this sign and stood on a busy road and um, it got a lot of attention. He stood there during, during rush hour. Um, one man out there. Uh, this is a picture of a township meeting, one of, uh, in my township, West Whiteland. Um, these room, these meetings used to have, you know, just a handful of residents showing up. And now when Mariner East is on the agenda, we get sometimes hundreds of people showing up. Next. Um, one other thing that we do, uh, you may recognize Big John Fetterman there. This was when he was a Lieutenant Governor candidate. And we often uh, encourage candidates and elected officials um, who are unfamiliar with the pipeline um, to come and meet with residents uh, and community leaders in their backyard so that they can see firsthand how it's impacting us. And that's, um, that's very powerful, these, uh, these meetings uh, and tours. Great, thank you, Jenny. And I wanna tell everybody that we're going to have another webinar uh, at the end of October. So please sign up for that webinar as well. The registration is open uh, right now. So it's just Bitly Mariner webinar three. Um, this is actually the third webinar we've done out of the, the um, webinar series. We're gonna do the third webinar. Uh, and then we may also do an additional fourth webinar. Um, but really this is an effort from um, many organizations, many uh, hours of time putting into this just to, so we have as many people educated throughout the state as possible. I think it's really important that people know what's going in their backyard, um, especially in those rural areas, because, you know, if, if someone is unfamiliar with what the pipeline is, like that the explosion in Salem Township, that was, you know, two miles from Penn Township where we are. Um, and the gentleman, you know, he was very, very badly hurt. It's a miracle that he survived. Uh, and they had no idea that that, that pipeline was, was on that property. Um, they were renting that home. I don't know if you recall the picture, but the house was leveled. There's not, there, there were just like one brick pillar left. So, and that's just a regular gas pipeline. We're talking about a much, much more volatile um, product here than your traditional natural gas pipeline. So people need to be aware that this is going through their backyard. So please help us spread the word. Please help us keep the pressure on. Uh, right now we're gonna take some Q&A. We've got our contact information here and um, we're gonna bring up this Q&A box. I'm not sure if it's gonna bring up on mine. I've got it up. Do you? Okay, great. Thank you, Ginny. Okay, so what's our first question there? Um, our first question, I'm looking for more for the question. This is a question from Angela. Um, she's asking, she says she has a question about eminent domain. So maybe if she could retype in that specific question, we can answer it. Because I think the way this works is I can't hear her respond if I ask her just out loud. So we'll move on to, uh, to the next one. Uh, this is from Judy. She says, I understand the gentleman injured in the Salem blast came from heat, not fire from the blast. Does your blue fog area include both fire and heat? That would be a question for you, George. Um, and you're on mute. <laughs> there you go. Um, 
I think you're still on. George, we can't hear you, just FYI. Maybe it's your headphones. So, so I would have to say while, while George is trying to get on, um, it was it was mostly from the heat. Um, and George, are you there? Um, I think so. Does that sound good? Yes, yes, you're good. there. Yeah, okay. So yeah, that is this funky headphone thing. Um, so the distinction between um, the, the, the heat and the fire um, is, is a pretty subtle one. In other words, uh, these blasts all involve heat and they will set things on fire at a distance. Um, to some extent, uh, so if you're in a cloud and it explodes and it does not set anything on fire, near you. I suppose you could say you were killed by the heat. It could also be from asphyxiation because the oxygen will be removed from the air. Um, I don't really make that distinction. The, the, the blue outline is the outline of the, of the flammable gas, and uh, that would include uh, in both fire and, and heat. It, it would also include, to some extent, what they call a concussion, which is the pressure of the blast. Um, what people would normally call uh, explosion, although there are uh, various technical um, definitions of that. But, um, but uh, I, yes, the simple answer is yes. Every, uh, all those things are included in the blue outline that I showed both in that first diagram and in the diagram about Mechanicsburg. Great. Right. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, next question is, was the pipeline in Beaver County that exploded carrying methane or NGLs? Um, it was, it was carrying a mixture. So this was, uh, you, you saw the pic picture of how the, those things are separated by cold. Uh, that had not happened yet with the gas mm -hmm. in that pipeline. So it was a mixture. It, it was, it's basically a gathering line. Is that right, George? That's right. Okay. All right, um, I will send that one. Um, okay, this is a, que a technical question from Lois. She would like a copy of the PowerPoint. We have family in Mechanicsburg all in the blast zone and she needs to educate them. Jillian, that one's for you. Yeah, so we will have a copy of the PowerPoint available. Um, I have to work out the details about if this recording will be available on the Halt the Harm website for the long term. Normally when Halt the Harm hosts websites, uh, they have them avail, or oh, I'm sorry, when they host webinars, they have them available on our website. I hope that they're able to do that with this one, even though um, they're not able to be here today. Um, but, but yes, and then if you want to contact Halt the Harm, um, you can go to halttheharm.net or you can go to ryan at halttheharm.net uh, and you can become a leader if you, so Halt the Harm Network, it has such unique services where they offer email services and, and kind of like technical services to um, organizing groups. Uh, and, and it's a really, they have a great way of doing this. And so I really encourage you to go online and see what they do. They've got tons of webinars. I've been a part of several webinars that they've hosted and they're all really, really good topics. Like we were talking about, um, when we were talking about how to document a complaint, uh, doing a right to know request or file review, we have a webinar already done on that and you can go back and, and look at that webinar. Some wonderful webinars on there. Um, so yes, will be a copy um, available and we're recording this. So there will be a recording of the webinar available. You can share with folks as well, Lois. Um, and then um, Ray asks, what uh, is Mr. Fetterman's position on the pipeline? That's a good question. Jillian, can I just, can I jump in one thing? So the PowerPoint will be available at the haltmarinernow.org. Yeah, so we can actually, we can make it available at the haltmarinernow.org website. We can put it on the website uh, tomorrow morning and uh, we'll also have a recording. So we'll have a, an actual recording of the wonderful presenters presenting the information um, via recording. So, um, and that will be either on the Halt the Harm website or Halt Mariner Now website as well. Okay, um, so back to Ray's question about Mr. Fetterman's position. 
who wants to tackle that? <laughs> There's a bit of nuance to it. George, were you, um, were you present for his tour? I wasn't there, but my understanding is that uh, he expressed um, sympathy and opposition to the pipeline, but uh, that, that really hasn't translated into anything in his current position. Is that your understanding, Virginia? That's my understanding. I believe it was something like it was a game changer for him to have that experience, but unfortunately it didn't change his game enough. Um, <laughs> we're not really, we're not seeing any action from him or Governor Wolf on this, so. Yeah, and in our neck of the woods, you know, um, you know, there, there's actually, um, in his hometown of uh, Braddock, there mm -hmm. is a new fracking well site that's proposed at the steel mill. And when it came to town or when, when it was being proposed, he was very excited about it. And we were just warning that, you know, not only um, do, do, does fracking uh, allow for these pipelines to be built, because if there was no fracking, if there was no product, there'd be no pipeline to put it in, um, but then also um, the fracking, the health concerns of uh, folks that are dealing with fracking, uh, that is multiplied by the health concerns of the folks down there at the steel mill because um, there, there are multiple industrial sources of pollution in one place. Um, so we really, you know, uh, the, we know that this extraction of natural gases and natural gas liquids is, um, is, is not a picnic for the people that live near those fracking sites. And so this pipeline is literally connecting us here in Pennsylvania, connecting the entire state with risk, um, which is why we're doing the webinar, which is why we felt compelled to do the, the, you know, the uh, campaign itself, because we want people to know what's going on. Um, so are there any other questions before we get off or any comments you guys want to make? I have, um, there's a couple more coming through on chat, if you want me to grab them quickly. Sure, yeah. Um, so Lois, do, 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 uh, okay, uh, Lois Peterson says, how weak or strong is Governor Wolf on stopping this pipeline? Um, I could jump in on that. <laughs> Please. Governor, Weath, Governor Wolf is, uh, is weak on it. Let's just say that. Um, we have asked him a number of times to use his authority to halt this uh, pipeline for safety concerns. Um, we have no way to protect the public and he has an obligation um, to, do, to, uh, to halt it until we, have, uh, until we have a plan like that. Um, he came to Chester County a few weeks ago finally and um, said, you know, after hearing people's stories about what they're dealing with, what their concerns are, um, he said point blank there that, uh, no, he will not halt it. So, um, and uh, he's been very supportive of this project all along. And um, we'll just keep on asking him, um, demanding that he exercises power. Do you wanna so read this one from Ellen here, um, Virginia? Yeah, I will add something that Nancy has just commented that despite saying he won't stop it, Wolf does not, Governor Wolf has not denied the risks and the issues that we've raised. Um, sorry, we have another question in here. Yeah, so. From Ellen. Yeah. Uh, for, oh, from Ellen Gerhardt. All right. Um, Ellen asks, Huntington County Emergency Management is having a public meeting on October 3rd for public input on upgrading their emergency response. During the last conversations I had with the director, he stated that emergency plans for pipeline evacuation were proprietary. These pipelines go under Lake Raystown, which is a major tourist destination in the summer. I truly don't think that people realize that for first responders, this will be a recovery, not a rescue operation. I don't know how to get people to see the dangers of this line. So perhaps the question is, how do we see, how do we get people to see the dangers of this line? And I'm kind of think we're doing it right now. Jillian, maybe you can chime in. Yeah, I think that that's a really um, important thing. Just share the information that we have provided about the risk assessments. And then um, I think it's really important to share it with first responders because, um, you know, first responders are people in your community that are just trying to do 
a job and many of our first responders are volunteers and they're not getting paid to come out and you know help evacuate people in this very dangerous situation so we really have to um you know to push for um the the this um, emergency management um situation and and please attend the meeting on october 3rd and i have to give it out to the the gerhardt's um i just read mm -hmm. something on um on their facebook today about a case they've been fighting sunoco along the way and and it hasn't been easy for them um but they're they're doing a tremendous job in, in trying to protect their land from eminent domain so great job guys keep up the good work <laughs> yes thank you there is one more uh, question here from bill he asks is there any comparable pipeline that already exists if so what happened uh there's a long answer to that, but let me just uh, answer briefly with two things. There are 14 what are called transmission lines in the United States for this type of material. None of them runs through any comparably populated area. They're mostly in Texas, but there are some running down through the Midwest. As well, a disaster. And we're just fortunate that that happened, uh, that that hasn't happened. Um, the other thing that I would say, though, is that the Fullensby, West Virginia accident that I mentioned was a uh, where no one was near it, but it uh, caused a, a large explosion. Uh, that was very comparable to the uh, Mariner East pipeline. It's the same diameter as the larger of the uh, Mariner East lines in our area. And uh, had that same explosion happened in a more populated area, there would certainly have been many fatalities. Great, thank you. And we are, we are just about time. Um, I do wanna mention too, um, we were talking about hazards, emergency management. Um, Lou mentioned that in Westmoreland County, um, we're actually helping um, comment on the hazard mitigation uh, plan in Westmoreland County that's being updated currently and um, they were uh, the, the team that is putting this together they're actually consulting with a firm um, to identify all these hazards and this is not something that was really on their radar so it's important to go to your county and talk to the county um, hazard team or every county should have what's called an LEPC, a Local Emergency Planning Commission. And that LEPC really drives that emergency response. You'll have, and, and local people, community members are supposed to be engaging in that process. And a lot of times we don't, um, but there should be meetings in your local county. I would encourage you to go to those local meetings and start asking questions and start finding out are people even aware of what's going on with Mariner East? Um, because it's really important that we educate our first responders and we educate everyone in our community. Um, so with that, I want to thank um, I want to thank Ginny and George for for coming on today and uh, helping us out with this presentation. I think it was very helpful and. Uh, just make sure you are signing up for our next webinar which is going to be at the end of October and join us tomorrow for our thunderclap. It's really, um, it's a, it's going to be a great, we want to really push the pressure. We want to pu push that needle over um, for Governor Wolf. So hopefully he starts seeing, um, seeing the light when it comes to this pipeline. Um, so thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Have a good night. Thank you all. Bye folks. Bye.